Good morning, and welcome to Renew Canada's Infra Intelligence series. My name is Corrine Lenz, and I'm the content director here at Actual Media. I'll be your moderator for today's Driving Diversity and Attracting Talent discussion. Before we get started, I'll give you a quick tour of the Crowdcast platform, so you're able to get as much information as possible out of today's session. By now, you've probably noticed a few people checking in on the right-hand side with the chat feature. Please say hello, let us know who you are and where you're from. Right above the chat, you'll see an Actual Media icon. If you click follow, you'll continue to be updated on our Infra Intelligence series as new webinars are announced. And down below, you'll see a variety of information. You can see how many people are signed in for today's webinar. You'll see the polls feature where we encourage you to cast your votes. And you'll see a little green button that links to the speaker's websites. So be sure to check those out as well. And most importantly is the ask a question feature. We don't have a formal Q&A period at the end of this webinar. So I'll do my best to integrate audience questions into the flow of the discussion as they come up. But please don't be shy, ask your question. There's a good chance others are wondering the same things that you are. This is our eighth Infra Intelligence webinar of 2021. Last month, we got a sneak peek of how Canada's top 100 infrastructure projects are progressing in light of the global pandemic and new funding announcements. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, and that is driving diversity and attracting talent. For any of you out there that are familiar with my background as a journalist, you'll know that I've had the opportunity to write many articles about impending skill shortages and attracting women, youth, and other racialized minorities to the construction and infrastructure industry. That said, in the 20 years I've been a journalist, I can't say that I've seen major progress on this front, but I think that's changing. I feel like we're on the cusp of some real change. With that in mind, I'm very excited about the panel of experts we have lined up for you today. So before I jump in and introduce you to our speakers, I'd like to take a few moments to acknowledge the many First Nations and Indigenous peoples of Canada as the original stewards of this great country. I'm here in Toronto, which is located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. We all share in the responsibility of our natural infrastructure, and there's much we can learn from the traditional knowledge of the land, water, and materials that allow us to build projects and benefit all Canadians. Okay, so let's get started and meet our experts. I'm going to begin by inviting each of the panelists to the screen. Once they're all on screen, I'll have each of them spend a couple minutes to introduce themselves and quickly tell us a bit about where they're from, what their role is, and what perspective they bring to today's discussion. First up, we have Maddie Simitiki, Director of Infrastructure at, or Director of the Infrastructure Institute from U of T. We have Jennifer Kahn, Head of Inclusive Diversity, People and Culture at Ellis Dawn. We've got Rosemary Powell, Executive Director, Toronto Community Benefits Network. And we've got Kathy Zoom, Associate Vice President at Instar AGF Asset Management, and she's also representing young leaders in infrastructure. So Maddie, why don't you start out and uh, give us your a little bit of an introduction and uh, some background about how what you're bringing to today's conversation. Hi, good morning. Um, it's great to be with everyone to have uh, this really important uh, conversation. And this moment is uh, the moment where we have to have this conversation and we have to come up with real solutions to uh, increase equity, diversity and inclusion in the construction and infrastructure sector. Um, my background is uh, I'm a professor uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, I've been studying and working on infrastructure projects for uh, over a decade. And uh, over that period, it's become increasingly clear uh, that this sector uh, has a major diversity gap. Uh, and some of the research that I've done over that period uh, has tried to put some uh, general numbers to how big that gap is. Uh, and when, when, when I think of uh, uh, equity and diversity and inclusion, uh, we're, I'm talking about uh, equi the equity, inclusion and diversion, uh, diversity across a variety of different uh, um, demographic characteristics along gender, uh, race, um, physical ability, all sorts of uh, different uh, aspects. And what we see is that this industry has had a huge gap. It has glass ceilings and glass walls. Um, in the leadership of our infrastructure projects, uh, those who are directing the projects, those who are the senior managers, the industry is not nearly uh, diverse enough. Uh, 
if, if, if you were to look at the boards of directors of Canadian construction companies and infrastructure companies, they often include few women uh, and they include a few racialized people uh, or indigenous people. Uh, when we look at a construction site, and uh, folks on this, uh, on this panel will speak to much, in much more detail than I will, uh, there are also huge gaps, often less than 10% and in some cases less than 5% of people on construction sites uh, are women uh, or people of color. So we have a huge gap and the impacts of this have become increasingly clear uh, in terms of uh, some of the horrific racist uh, incidents that have happened on construction sites uh, just in the last year or two. Uh, people finding uh, nooses on construction sites and other graffiti and just horrific uh, uh, actions that show that we need much more. Uh, we, need to, we need to do much better. And the fact that we're talking about this is really a first step. Uh, when I started in this industry, there was very little conversation about this. Uh, and, I, and at conferences, it, was, it received very little discussion. And I think now now, based on the work of folks on this call and others, uh, it is an, is an issue that we cannot look away from. And we have a huge talent gap and we are missing out on a large uh, share of, of our community who could both contribute to projects and benefit from them. Uh, and so once we see that we have a gap, uh, once we see the incidents that are happening on construction sites, once you see this, you can't look away anymore. And I hope conversations like this push all of us to say how in our own work and how as a sector can we do better. Thank you so much, Patty. Jennifer, you're up next. Thank you. Uh, and thank you so much for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you on this on this panel. Um, so my name is Jennifer Khan. I am the head of inclusive diversity at Elliston. For those that don't know, Elliston is a multi-billion dollar company that offers cradle to grave services from coast to coast and beyond. So we're, we're more than just your typical construction company. I've been out with Ellis John for about 10 years, traditionally in the learning and development space. And as of a few years ago, I started to look at diversity and inclusion within Ellis John at the request of our CEO and president and our SVP of, of people and culture. And from there, there was no turning back for me. For me. So I started working in this space three, a few years ago, typically from the side of my desk because I was still doing my full-time job in, in uh, learning and development. And as of 2020, I did take on this role full-time. And I think um, building on what Maddie said, the, me taking on this role full-time and Ellis Don dedicating this resource is absolutely a sign of what is to come and how important this topic is now, has always been, but definitely now and moving into the future. So I'm very fortunate to be able to be working in this space. And I think the perspective that I offer is what it's really like and what it's really like in the construction industry and what are some of the situations that we're dealing with and how do we deal with them and how do we make this better? And I'll tell you, it's not easy. Um, and I think that we'll discuss that even more in this panel today. But the other thing that I'll, that I'll mention is that I'm a mom. I've got two young boys at home. I'm part of an inter, uh, interracial marriage as well. And I think that this offers a really personal aspect for me as well and something that really touches me at home and at the workplace. And I always say that, you know, the work that I do is very difficult, but it's really important for me to model the behaviors that I want to see for my son because my sons are going to be in this next generation and I want them to know what a feminist looks like and not the ones that you see on TV doing all this crazy stuff, but the ones who are using the voice, their voice to empower other people, the ones who are really trying to initiate change and make things better for everyone else and, and not being afraid to be that feminist and kind of reclaiming that term. So thank you for having me today and happy to share my insights and experiences so far. Oh, thank you for being here. Rosemary, over to you. Thank you. I am also very pleased to be here and among all of you and looking forward to this rich discussion about this really important subject that is near and dear to my heart. Um, so my name is Rosemary Powell and I am the executive director of the Toronto Community Benefits Network. It's an organization that formed back in 2013 as uh, we looked on the amount of investment that our different levels of government was investing in infrastructure. And as we, uh, you know, organized in communities across the city of Toronto, we really recognized that the voices of people who have been, you know, left out of the economy, black racialized indigenous peoples really have not been centered in the conversation. The planning process has systemically left out 
the voices of people who really need it the most. And so we basically organized to become that, uh, you know, to be able to intervene in the process. And our first project that uh, we identified was the Metrolinks uh, project, Eglinton Crossdown. That was an $8.5 billion spend on transit. And who doesn't want transit in their neighborhood? Everybody does. But at the end of the day, how can we look at using this money that is being spent already and to ensure that there are dedicated uh, commitments that come out of it that will support underrepresented groups to be able to access the jobs and opportunities that come out of it. And so as a community labor coalition, we have grown from 13 uh, member organizations and groups from across the city to now being 120 member organizations and groups who are focused on this effort and who are working one project at a time to ensure that there are benefits for the local communities. We look at jobs and opportunities, not after the project is being built. We don't wanna just ride uh, the transit, you know, safely, faster, greener. We also wanna be able to benefit from working on building that project. Everybody wants to be able to participate in building up their local communities. And these are voices and these are people's talents that have been historically left out of uh, the, you know, the, the opportunities. And so we look at jobs and opportunities while the project is being built. So we're looking at construction jobs, uh, construction contracts for small businesses and social enterprises, minority owned businesses. But we're also looking for, um, you know, neighborhood and environmental improvements. How do we ensure that the spaces that are being built are not exclusive and that gentrification doesn't happen? What about those people who have been living in those neighborhoods and living in the situations of underinvestment and poverty and uh, you know, degradating infrastructure? We don't want them to have to move out of their communities because a new shiny uh, infrastructure project is built. And so that's the work that we're doing and we're really proud to be working with the industry, uh, with uh, companies like Elistan and Acon and Metrolinx and uh, our union partners, uh, Carpenters Union, um, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, etc., to really be able to come together for community to be a part of the solution. Thank you so much, Rosemary. All right, Kathy, you're uh, up next. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you everyone for having me here today. Um, uh, my name is Kathy Zhu. I'm joining on behalf of Young Leaders in Infrastructure. So Young Leaders in Infrastructure is an organization that's affiliated with the Canadian Council of Public-Private Partnership. Um, our mission is to uh, increase the educational and networking opportunities for young professionals who are you know, either interested in joining the infrastructure industry or are already started their careers in the industry. Um, we have a pretty wide reach among young professionals in infrastructure. We have a membership base of uh, more than 100, uh, more than 1,100 people. Um, in my professional career, um, I am an associate vice president with Instar Asset Management. So Instar is a private equity investor. Uh, we're focused on investments in the infrastructure industry, anything from like digital infrastructure, transportation to you know social infrastructure and power re and renewables. Um, we currently have um, 3 billion asset under management and we um, engage with uh, 1,600 employees across our nine portfolio companies. Um, so today um, I look forward to sharing some of the perspectives in, in, in terms of you know, engaging with young people who are interested in the infrastructure sector, um, as well as you know, increasing uh, diversity and inclusion in the private equity and investment industry. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. All right, uh, before we dig in, I did, I wanted to echo something that Maddie said earlier, which is, I, I, this is a, diversity isn't an easy topic to handle in a lot of cases. It's sometimes very uncomfortable, very emotional, sometimes frustrating and downright difficult. Um, I, I know that just from personal conversations I've had with people in preparation for this webinar. So I appreciate very much having our panel of experts here to help us navigate this uh, and to help us guide through, you know, the language, the topic, and uh, ideally give us some advice on how to move forward within our own organizations. Now, Maddie, you've already given us a bit of a lay of the land. Um, if you have more to add in terms of where we're at currently and certainly uh, how the progress has gone since there's a report that you had, a paper that had been written, and I'm going to add a link to that in the uh, chat here, but in 2019. So 
where are we at now and has there been progress since 2019? Whoop, just one second, Maddie, you're muted there. <laughs> Natasha will have to unmute you behind the scenes. He's, he's still on mute. Sorry, just one second, Maddie. Okay. It looks like Natasha is going to try and sort that out. <laughs> so, oh, wait, can we hear you now, Maddie? No? All right. So you know what we'll, what we'll do is we'll just dive in and maybe you, we can come back to this a little bit in terms of towards the end of this conversation. I've got a question um, about, you know, overcoming obstacles. So we can sort of maybe do a bit of that then. All right, so everyone on this panel who in, is involved in some way or another with programs that are designed to help close that diversity gap. With the goal of providing attendees on this particular webinar with ideas that they can take back to their own organizations or informing them about programs they could potentially access, I'd love to go around now to each of the panelists and hear about some of the diversity initiatives that they're involved with. Um, Jennifer, I, I mean, I have a construction background in my world, so there's not many organizations out there that are more traditionally male dominated than construction. Can you tell us a little bit how Ellis Dawn has elevated its diversity initiatives in recent years? And it sounds to me like a big part of that has been creating the role that you're now in, but I'd love to hear about other initiatives as well uh, over the last few years, certainly, and what Ellis Dawn's been up to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I would say if to kind of your, your original question of has there been has there been progress? I think based on the experiences that, I, that I've heard and that, that have been shared with me from LSO employees, the answer is, yeah, there's been progress. But the better question is, is it enough? And I think the answer is no, it's not enough. I remember I've been in this industry now for many, many years. And I remember my first <laughs> my first jaunt on a job site, I was walking on the site, just walking with the superintendent and the roofers on this site were catcalling at me as I was walking through. Thankfully, well, mostly thankfully, that doesn't happen anymore when I walk on job sites. But at the same time, there are still elements and, and aspects of this where I remember walking on a site with uh, four other women, and I think it was the only time I've ever walked a site with five women all together, and heads were turning because it was just a site that typically wasn't seen before. And thankfully, that that's all that it was. But I think there has been progress, but it certainly hasn't been enough. Um, and if it has been enough, or otherwise, we, we all wouldn't be here today. Um, but essentially, at Ellis Dong, we've been focusing the past few years on a couple of different major initiatives, and obviously, there's a plethora of things in between. But if I were to boil it down, I would say two different things. So one, on training and education, and then on the second piece on recruitment and retention. So if I start with the training and education, I think one of the first things that we did was create an inclusive diversity training module that is, is now mandatory for all employees. And we've also shared it out with all, all, all of the industry. And basically anybody who wants access to this, we're happy to share that out. Uh, with anybody and really what we found out as we were developing that training is that people really needed to be able to have the opportunity and the tools to be able to talk safely about race and ethnicity and racism and discrimination within the construction industry and i think to your point earlier it's something that can be very uncomfortable and as we start to see that it's not just about logically what the historic what the history has been what the what the facts tells us but also how that makes people feel. And you can't underestimate the emotional attachment that they have to experiences and how that impacts the way in which we communicate about race and religion and ethnicity and discrimination. So our first run at training was about trying to give people the tools to be able to have those conversations. What does it mean to be inclusive? What does it mean to be diverse? And which one's more important? And we did that through sharing employee stories. And we had very brave employees who came up to share their experiences and how it impacts them. And that initial training uh, came off really well with our organization because it gave people a face, it gave people a story, it made it more personal, and it wasn't something that just happens over there or on that side of the, the border. Discrimination and tolerance happens in Canada, and I can't say that enough. Discrimination in, happens in Canada, and I think that people need to acknowledge that for us to be able to change it. And that is one hesitation that I think that I've seen across the industry is they think it's a, something over there. 
So in addition to training, having monthly spotlights on diversity, uh, inclusion, having actually celebrating now uh, cultural significant days and religious holidays and be able to help people understand what those are and have some understanding about them. We're also really looking internally at how we uh, recruit people. So that includes looking at our partnerships and going to places where we haven't gone before. So we've been able to establish some really great relationships and we're looking for more. But to give you examples of a couple of them, there's one, there's a bridging program through Access International and they help um, facilitate internationally trained professionals into finding their first job in Canada. And we've had great success being able to tap into that talent pool that honestly, some of them may have been overlooked in the the gauntlet of resume screening because they don't have that Canadian job experience, but we know that they're still qualified for these roles. So whether it's Access International or the Edmonton Mennonite Center for Newcomers, we're going coast to coast to find out where there's organizations that are already committed to what we're trying to accomplish and partnering with them. Another one that we've been looking at is the Redwood. And so the Redwood House is a house that our service that offers um, education and support for women and non-binary folk who are escaping domestic violence. And they have a construction program. They've got clients, their clients who are looking to get into this industry because they realize that there will be a gap and we will be looking for people. So being able to expand where we recruit from and being able to diversify that talent pool is one way in which we've been able to uh, make some progress. So the question is, is it working? depends on how you look at it i'd say in, <laughs> i'd say if i look at our data so we are collecting self um, employee data and it's all voluntary uh, from our employees but looking at our data in 2021 those that we hired in the first quarter of this year we have seen a 6.5 percent increase in women um, being brought into our organization compared to our overall uh, population, as well as 11% more folks from diverse backgrounds in comparison to our overall population. So we are absolutely seeing numerically some of the impacts of this effort and being able to uh, offer this environment of inclusion and diversity. But much like many organizations, we are still working on our strategy to help propel career development so that we are seeing those levels of diversity at our more senior uh, levels as well. So in some cases, we are making progress. And in some cases, progress is taking uh, longer than I think any of us would like. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right, okay. Kathy, as a board member of Young Leaders in Infrastructure, can you share with us some of the initiatives that you're working on to attract more young people to the infrastructure sector? And certainly, please feel free to add info about anything that uh, or programs with your own company as well. Yeah, yeah, thank you um, for having me here today. So uh, as I mentioned before, Young Leaders Infrastructure, our mission is to provide an educational and networking platform for young professionals or students who are interested in the infrastructure sector. So um, on the educational side, um, we hold regular events and, you know, speaker series to provide um, a sort of knowledge and, um, you know, information on the infrastructure sector and sort of highlight to them what could be attractive to them, right? So a couple of examples that, uh, of events that we recently did we had panel discussions on green transport corridor um, on project finance during covid and we also hold like regular speaker series um, um just discussing the general macroeconomic environment uh well, we, we do that with uh, we collaborate with like major um, banks such as rbc and you know um, we'll invite the economists from from the banks to to speak at these events um, on the sort of networking side, um, we have um, semi-annual social events um, that has been impacted by COVID, obviously, but, uh, you know, um, we, we're looking forward to this winter when, when we open, open up a, a bit more. So um, we, um, we, we, as I mentioned, we have a membership base of about um, 1,100 people. And, you know, at one of our previous summer show, socials in downtown Toronto, we had a great turnout of more than 400 people. Um, so it was, it was a very exciting event. And as we are affiliated with the Canadian Council of Public-Private Partnership, um, as you guys probably heard of them, the, the major event they, they hold every year is the CCPVP conference. So uh, that brings together a lot of the industry leaders to, to, to you know, discuss the, the major themes of the, the, the P3 um, industry. And you know, as um, for young leaders, we um, we hold like chat rooms for young professionals at the CCPVP conference, and we usually have a social event after the conference as well. 
So um, yeah, it's very exciting. I, I personally really enjoyed, um, you know, uh, engaging with young people uh, with young leaders infrastructure. I've been involved for six years myself, and uh, I have, um, you know, served on the board of the Toronto chapter for the past three years. Uh, it's been a very exciting journey for me. Uh, maybe moving on to you know my professional career um, as well. Um, you know um, I work in the infrastructure and private equity industry, um, like uh, some of the other finance sectors. Um, it's um, traditionally an industry where we've had some challenges in terms of promoting diversity and inclusion. Um, I, I, I mean a personal example for for myself is um, I actually started my career um, as an investment banker um, with one of the Wall Street investment banks, and um, I was one of the I was the only woman on a team of 60 investment bankers. Um, and um, I've um, since I joined my current company, Instar, in 2014, I had the opportunity to you know, grow alongside the company and um, really witness the, the efforts by our leadership team here to promote diversity and inclusion. Um, today, um, at Instar, um, a third of our employees are, are women and uh, about half um, identify as minorities. So um, I'm very um, you know, excited to witness that whole journey. And um, I mean, along that process, I think um, it's, um, you know, we have to actively promote mentorship and, um, you know, engagement. Um, it doesn't come very easily, but um, it surely can be done from my perspective. And, um, you know, at, at Instar, we also look to engage with the you know, students who might be interested in the infrastructure investment sector. Um, we have uh, regular engagements with the universities and colleges, and we have um, two to three interns uh, from schools working with us at any given time. Um, I recently um, spoke to some of them who are currently working with us, and I think um, a very helpful feedback from them is that they said infrastructure is a relatively niche sector uh, when it comes to schools. It's not like as widely promoted as some the things like, for example, investment banking or consulting. And we usually, um, I mean, really as an industry, we could probably do better in terms of more engagement at schools and just to, to a lot of them, you know, is kind of struggling to to really picture what infrastructure actually is, right? And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's it's really a very easy answer. It's like you look at the hospitals, um, in your community, the, the roads and, the, you know, the power generation facilities and, you know, the, um, the fiber that brings internet to your home, that's all infrastructure. And I think um, it's, um, it could probably be helpful for us to highlight how infrastructure impacts everybody's lives and could, you know, help build our community. So, um, yeah, that's, um, um. <laughs> that was good timing. <laughs> <laughs> Just wrapping up, which is great. Uh, I'm sure she'll be back with us in a second. Rosemary, I, you've already touched on it a little bit, but I'd love to hear more. Um, you had some great success stories negotiating Ontario's first community benefits framework for the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, and then the subsequent campaigns to secure committee benefits for the Finch West LRT, the West Park Healthcare Center, and Rexdale Woodbine Casino expansion. Um, I would also love to hear about the diversity awards as well, as that was something that popped up in all my research as well. So please uh, go ahead and tell us about some of the initiatives. And same thing, I'd love to hear how it's progressing and is it working? You know, are we getting making some, some gains? I think we're definitely making gains. As a community, we have organized ourselves to intervene in the process and not just to sit back anymore and just to see it happen and to complain about it. But we know that we have uh, incredible talent that we can bring to this. And, uh, you know, community benefits is a process that allows us to be able to intervene in the planning process and to be a part of the decision making. And so on these different projects that we're now supporting, TCBN is at the table with all the key stakeholders like, uh, you know, the Government of Ontario, Infrastructure Ontario, uh, the Ministry of Labour, Training and Skills Development, the City of Toronto, and basically as a community, um, you know, we're making sure that um, our voices are heard and we're negotiating, um, you know, with uh, with the key uh, decision makers to make it happen. And we're seeing that, you know, the, the, the jobs and the opportunities are really uh, coming through. Now, um, you know, we focus on two aspects, not just the negotiations uh, for the community benefits agreements, but also we support the implementation. And so um, we have established different types of uh, programs to help kind of fill gaps within the ecosystem of community benefits. I had explained that we had 120 members uh, from across the city. These are all organizations and groups and labor organizations and social enterprises that basically provides different uh, you know, the types of support, 
products and services, whether it be apprenticeship training or employment services, uh, you know, different types of wraparound services. And we're right there in the center trying to coordinate all of that and to make sure that there is a seamless pathway into the jobs and opportunities that have been uh, negotiated and committed to. And so uh, with respect to the apprenticeships, we have, um, you know, the quick start in construction, which is a 140 hour apprenticeship training program um, where basically we provide, uh, you know, uh, theory about the, the industry. Because remember, these are people who haven't been in the industry uh, historically. And so they don't have a brother and uncle and father who can kind of give them a sense as to, you know, what to expect and when they have uh, you know, issues and challenges, you know, who do you turn to? Oftentimes what we've discovered is that there's this U-turn. Sometimes they do get in, but three months later, six months later, they're out and they don't know what, what, what happened. So um, through this uh, training program, we're able to provide the, the, you know, the theory. We provide them with their basic tickets. Uh, so, um, you know, working at heights, um, uh, you know, health and safety, uh, you know, elevated platform. Well, I've already said that. But anyways, the idea is that we provide those basic tickets that give them something they could put on their resume to demonstrate that they are ready, uh, you know, to get in. And we provide basic hand tool trainings as well. And then we support them through a job developer to get intake into the different unions. And because TCBN is a community labor coalition, our labor partners are right there with us uh, you know, helping us to identify when opportunities are available and helping us to prepare the candidates to be able to get in. And not only that, we have a mentorship program, which is, uh, you know, our pride and joy. Uh, it's the Next Gen Builders mentoring program just in, uh, you know, 2020 during the height of the COVID pandemic. Um, you know, we just, we, we have to increase our services to make sure that those people who have, we've been working to support to get into the industry don't get, uh, you know, don't get left behind and that they can, you know, keep up. Um, you know, with their, uh, you know, with their studies, with their education and, you know, getting their hours uh, on the job site. And so we had 588 people. <laughs> That's the last count, <laughs> you know, that, um, you know, participated in the next gen builders. And we had mentors coming from the industry to kind of support and to guide. Um, we uh, um, had our building diversity awards, for example, that was uh, that happened in uh, you know this year May, and that was really to just recognize and uphold, uplift all of those construction partners, the unions and the uh, you know the the contractors who have been doing their level best. Uh, you know, to change internally the way how they do business. And uh, we actually acknowledged Metrolinx as the first um, client owner to implement community benefits, um, Crosslinks Transit Solutions for the Eglinton Crosstown and uh, La Yuna 506, because together they really created that environment that enabled the success of the community benefits agreement. Because there is one thing to actually make a commitment. The next thing is to actually um, uh, um, fulfill um, the commitment, especially for an industry ju that just has a really terrible track record of doing this. In 2020, we, you know, there were nooses found on construction sites. Like this just gives you a sense as to the deep systemic, you know, issues that the industry is dealing with right now. And uh, as a community, um, you know, we want to be there as a part of the solution. Thank you. All right, Maddie, I'm informed that your mic should be okay. Oh, look at that. It's good. All right. It's working. Um, so let me just pose the question it, to you, which is through your research and many infrastructure connections, um, we'd love to hear about any standout programs that you've either come across through your research and certainly what is the university doing to attract students to the subject as well? I would start out by saying that the standouts are around this virtual table. Um, and in many ways, I'm happy that the uh, my mute button fail um, <laughs> allowed others to speak first and hear the the programs that are uh, that they're running because I think it's you know it's in the the successes that they're having and uh, the innovations that they're bringing forward that change is going to happen. I mean, this is not going to happen by accident. This industry has been going for hundreds of years uh, with deep systemic inequalities baked right into its its core in terms of who's building the projects, who's planning the projects, and who's being impacted uh, by the infrastructure that's being built. And uh, it's it's folks like those around this table that uh, have been uh, 
uh, uh, actively and passionately working to make those changes. So uh, Toronto Community Benefits Network, for one, is always an organization that, that I um, highlight and Rosemary's work uh, is just remarkable, the efforts that have been done uh, to, to bring uh, change uh, in this industry uh, and industry leaders uh, and people working within companies that uh, may not have originally thought that they had a problem, but through the advocacy of uh, people internally and external voices, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, making comment from the outside, the two of those combined is where a change is going to is, is going to come from. I mean, just to give you a sense of the numbers, because I know you asked about that earlier. Um, I had done an, uh, a global study. The data was collected 2017 uh, in that in that area uh, in that time frame, and uh, I mean the, the the gaps in uh, in 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 diversity and inclusion along gender and racial lines are just are just stunning. Um, uh, 17. This is for the public-private partnership industry in particular, but it, it has broad application across the construction sector. 17% um, of workforce of the workforce at the board of directors tables uh, and at the senior management levels were women, uh, and only 7% were racialized people. And when you drill down even further, uh, you see that Black and Indigenous people are especially uh, missing from those tables, and Black women and Indigenous women even more specifically. There are huge gaps. I mean, less than 1% of, of the leadership uh, is uh, uh, black women and indigenous women. I mean, it is it is a stunning gap in uh, in in who's making the decisions that then lead to all of uh, uh, the projects uh, that get done. And the Canadian industry has its own gaps as well uh, at the leadership tables. I mean, you you would uh, at least when I was doing the study, you could find uh, construction companies that had board of directors with no women on them. Uh, this is in Canada within the last five years. This, this is not ancient history. And uh, and it, it then starts to manifest in terms of whose voices are heard. So a, a, a former student of mine who's now a colleague, uh, Cecilia Pai, did a study looking at, uh, she went and watched the, the videos of board meetings for the public transit agencies in New York, Toronto, uh, at Metrolinx, uh, uh, and in Vancouver for TransLink, and watched who was doing more of the speaking and what people were talking about. Uh, she found that uh, there not only were there fewer women, uh, disproportionately fewer women on these boards, but they also spoke less than their time on the boards. They were interrupted more. They had less input on key decisions related to uh, uh, issues of finance, budget, project management. I mean, this is this is what it means. This is what systemic inequality does, and how it cascades through the systems uh, to then impact on the decisions, and then ultimately on the projects that get built and the experience on the job sites. And so, um, again, to come back to it, the folks around this virtual table are the ones who are uh, who are advocating and uh, and 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 enforcing this change to happen in an industry that uh, it's taken uh, far too long to occur. Thank you. I mean, that's a, it's a lot to swallow. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there's a lot to do. There is a lot to do. Mm -hmm. um, all right. I, before we move into the next group of questions, which is going to tackle some of this, I'm just going to uh, go through our ask a question box because I know there's some questions from the audience here. Um, let's start with, do you think companies have increasingly begun to regard inclusion and diversity as a source of competitive advantage and specifically as a key enabler of growth? Anybody want to jump in on that one? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll jump right in. I think right. uh, the community benefits movement has grown. Again, in 2020, TCBN partnered with organizations across Canada to organize what uh, the inclusive recovery campaign. Basically, uh, you know, stressing <laughs> to our elected officials um, at the federal level that they needed to include community benefits agreement as part of any infrastructure spend that they were going to do, do especially after we're trying to recover from a, mm -hmm. an incredible pandemic that has just uh, devastated especially communities of color and um you know they heard us loud and clear in fact the press release that they had announcing that their a uh, 12 billion dollar commitment to um you know four transit projects uh, in uh, in uh, in Toronto um they used the inclu inclusive recovery language <laughs> and said that it will include community benefits agreement so more and more as policies are being established at the federal provincial and municipal levels and also within major uh you know institutions 
uh, you know, these general contractors are finally recognizing that it's not something that can be ignored anymore and that uh, they do have to change their practices and intentionally look at ways during the bidding process to include what their commitments to community benefits are going to be and to carve out specific targets um, that they intend to reach. So, yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, they do see the bottom line. I would absolutely agree with that. I think that Rosemary and, and the TC Bands work has done a really great job of making sure that this is not a nice to have, that diversity inclusion has to be part of what we do as, an, as a company and as an organization. If I would offer my opinion on whether or not companies are using this to be a competitive advantage, I think some are. And I've heard some companies are saying, here, you, you want to hire me because here's what we're doing for the community. Here's what we're doing for diversity and inclusion. And while that is absolutely in this day and age, a competitive advantage. At Ellis Dawn, I never want to do that. I, I respect those that need to do that and want to do that, but I don't want to. And, and that's something that we've taken a very hard stance on because I believe that there are so many other factors that GCs and the industries and companies can compete on that diversity and inclusion should not be one of them. We should just all be doing this together. So I, I don't like the idea of competing on whether or not my program is better than your program. I'd rather just say thank you for having a program. So I think that's one part of it. Um, but the other thing is that as Ellis John is one of the, the larger players in the industry, I think that we also have a responsibility to uplift organizations and companies that aren't as big as us and don't have the resources that we do in-house. And that's why we've made it a mission or I've made it a mission to share out everything that we've been doing and all of our resources can be found on the CCA, the Canadian Construction Association website, and that's something that we will continue to do. And if people want to use it and they like it, great. If they don't want to use it, they want to change it, that's great too. Um, but I think that we have a responsibility to share that out as a large organization. And I don't want us to compete on this because it, then it just makes it something that, you know, divides us when it should be something that unites us. I want to jump in again and just to say, like, that's leadership. That's what we call leadership, Jennifer. And, um, you know, one of the challenges that we've been having with the community benefits agreements that we have in place right now is what you spoke to is the subcontractors. The major general contractors like Ellis Don are doing so much better because they have the infrastructure in place, the back end HR and uh, procurement teams uh, to be able to kind of, uh, you know, take leadership on this. But drilling that down into the subcontractor community, that's where the issue is. On the Eglinton Crossdown project, 20% of the work is actually self-performed by the general contractors themselves. But 80% of it, it's all subcontracting and they're not doing very well at all. In fact, Metrolinx is demonstrating good outcomes for the jobs that they've committed to. But um, only 30, I think it's 56 people since the last five years that have been demonstrated to be hired uh, by the subcontractors. So we got a lot of work to do. We do. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to keep us moving forward because this is a great conversation. We have lots to cover. Um, so what can we do as organizations to make ourselves more attractive to women, underrepresented racial groups and youth when we're recruiting? How does our culture need to change? Um, I was speaking to someone else, another industry expert about this earlier in the week, and they had made some really great examples about the language that we use um, in job descriptions and things like that. What other, um, how else do we need to change our culture? How else can we recruit and attract people that maybe wouldn't have felt comfortable applying for these roles in the past? And do you, Jennifer, do you want to jump onto this one? I feel like you're nodding away there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there are a number of different ways that we can, as an industry, better recruit and show the breadth of work and, and career opportunities within this industry in that a lot of them, um, they don't need to be male dominated. There's no reason for that anymore. So I think that from a education perspective, that's something that we can certainly offer. But I think if I were to boil this down to two things, one, I think that we need to celebrate a heck of a lot more. I think that diversity and inclusion is a very difficult, um, difficult topic to talk about. And I think that the TC Band Building uh, Diversity Awards, it's a great way to be able to highlight all the good news stories that are happening at, uh, within the industry. And then at Ellis Dawn, we're actually hosting a virtual event on September the 8th, and that is all about celebrating diversity within our organization. And so I can certainly put the link in the 
the chat there, but I think it's about highlighting all of the things that we're doing really well, knowing that we've got a ton of work left to do, but that there are some really great examples of, of success stories. And I think that we need to do a better job at communicating that. And the second thing that I would say is that I think that we need to focus on inclusion more so than we need to focus on the diversity numbers and factors. Because like Rosemary talked about, there is a U-turn. There is a, I want to be here. And then once you're there, you're like, oh, I don't want to be here anymore. <laughs> and you're shocked. And so I think that organizations really need to look at that. And I think that we also need to look at more than just the gender binary. It's not just women we need to attract into this industry. We need to attract more non-binary folk into the industry. We need to attract part people from the LGBTQ2S plus community. We need to attract people with disabilities into the community. There's so many other aspects of diversity that I think are often not talked about when we just think about the binary gender um, avenues. And I think that more people need to understand that for us to be able to enact change, you've got to be willing to change yourself. If you can't do that, if you're not willing to walk the walk and talk the talk and put the investment in that's required for you to do that, then you've got no then you've got no skin in the game. So it's a bit of a tough message, but it's the, the true method message of you've got to look yourself in the mirror every single day and and identify your own bias and and help those around you do the same in order for us to make change. And that is not an easy thing. Can I pick up on uh, some of Jennifer's uh, comments? Because I think the word that comes to my mind is intentionality. It's that mm -hmm. if we just leave this like a, you know, like a like like a twig floating down a river, uh, and it's going to change over time because the current is going to take it there anyway. It, it's going to take centuries. It is not going to change on its own. And I think, to me, then it comes down to like how do we how do we uh, get intentional about this, and how do we uh, uh, as an how does this industry get intentional about recruitment and some of the work that uh, Rosemary and TCBN is doing uh, about uh, uh, promoting uh, the construction and, and and development industry more broadly uh, to a wider range of people, and then how do the organizations themselves intentionally understand uh, about recruitment but also workplace culture i think the culture part is key and um we've talked about it a little bit i mean there what i think a sign of leadership is all is not just what how do we celebrate when things go right but also what do we do when things go wrong and there have been i mean we we have talked about this uh, that there have been these horrific incidents on construction sites of blatant racism on sites that are building facilities that are meant to build up our communities and be sites of inclusion like hospitals or like public transit. Folks building those projects have faced horrendous racism on those sites. So the question isn't just how do you get people into the industry and how do we celebrate, but then what what does the industry do? And there, there, there was a lot of, um, outcry when those uh, uh, when when those incidents happen uh, and that that is also a sign of an industry that's being intentional to say like we're not only are we not going to tolerate this but we are going to put clear measures in place and clear punishments in place when things go wrong so that people do feel like they can be a part of this uh, industry and that there's that the tone is coming right from the top that this will not be tolerated uh, when these type of uh, uh, incidents do occur yeah, maybe just to echo what everybody just said, I think when I think about, you know, promoting more participation by youth or promoting diversity and inclusion, I think what comes to mind is, you know, um, first, first of all, engagement and participation and mentorship, right? So uh, I think I'll speak a little bit more about each one of those. Um, in terms of, you know, engagement, I think it's organizations such as Young Leaders Infrastructure, I think um, they're important, uh, you know, as a, a platform for people to find, you know, friends frankly, in the industry and see, uh, you know, examples of how uh, the infrastructure industry can really you know, enrich people's lives and the communities as well. Um, I'm also personally part of another organization called Women Capital Markets. So um, it, this, this organization sort of brings together women from um, the, the capital markets. Um, and, uh, you know, we, um, we have mentorship programs, um, you know, interacting with senior women leader, leaders and, you know, really learning from, uh, their experience in terms of navigating uh, this industry, which traditionally has some challenges in terms of you know diversity and inclusion, um, you know in terms of participation, I think um, really um, it's um, 
actually in the infrastructure and private equity investment community, uh, there's you know increasing focus on increasing women's participation in senior leadership positions, which you know people already talked about, as well as on company sports. Um, you know we um, are actively promoting more diversity and inclusion and uh, participation by women and minority across our portfolio companies, which um, you know um, I, I I I have witnessed the efforts uh, across that, and you know um, we we now have you know talented women on our portfolio companies boards um, within my my uh, Instar's own senior leadership team team as well, and I know it's just um, it's it's a tremendous effort to you know bring more diverse voices to um, the decision making and investment processes, and and, and you know I also touch on mentorship. I think. That's very uh, like it, this personally uh, very important to me as well. Um, as I mentioned, I, I started um, at a Wall Street investment bank, being the only woman in a team of sixty. And um, at that time, I actually really struggled with you know seeing a career path for myself because I didn't have an example to look up to. Um, at Instar, um, I greatly benefited from a mentorship program. Um, our senior women leaders um, had um, invested time and efforts, you know, to mentor me, and uh, it's, it's that sort of environment which. Uh, you know, makes it easier for young people to to really you know fall in love with the industry. Amazing. And for me, I would add to that um, intentionally. Uh, intentionality is absolutely key. And what I would add to that is practicality. <laughs> um, for people who have not been in the industry and who we know for a fact are people who have been more uh, you know been dealing with issues of poverty and you know unemployment and and all of that how can you expect them to um you know the the, the, the cost of getting into an apprenticeship is it's it's pretty expensive um first of all you have to do some training in the meantime for the those first eight weeks of training they got to eat you know how are we making sure that those practical issues like provide making sure that they have an income while they're training to be able to eat to provide, um, you know, food and clothing. Do you know how expensive it is <laughs> to 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 gear yourself up to get onto a job site? In the winter, we have young people who are basically freezing their asses off. Excuse my language. <laughs> uh, you know, how do we make sure that those costs are kind of thought through and that they're supported as they're trying to get into that space? For women, I would be remiss if I don't just mention the need for childcare services. Mm -hmm. When you're going on to a job site, you got to be up by, you know, five o'clock in the morning and be ready to get out of there and to be on site ready and free of mind to be able to work in a safe environment. If you're worried about how your child is doing, you know, and, and you can't find child care or you have to run around to take your child somewhere before you get into the job, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really, really challenging. So those practical issues, you know, driver license, clothing, food, housing, really needs to be addressed as part of the efforts that we're going to be making as an industry to ensure that those people who have been underrepresented in the industry have a real chance of being able to enter, but also to succeed during that really complex and challenging um, you know, apprenticeship uh, journey. And so that's why through community benefits agreements, not only do we negotiate, jobs, but we also would negotiate neighborhood and environmental improvements. And for example, on the casino Woodbine project, we ensured that there was going to be a $5 million uh, childcare um, uh, that is dedicated as part of the community benefits agreement. And we need to see more and more of that included as part of the things that the general contractors will ensure becomes a part of any build for infrastructure that is going to happen. Uh, so we've got time, I think, for one more question from our attendees here. And we very briefly, uh, Jennifer touched on this, but can we please speak to the inclusion of people living with disabilities? That's not something that's come up overly, but it's certainly, you know, a very big one. Are there initiatives in place to do for that as well? I mean, making our work sites accessible, making our offices accessible. Are there opportunities there? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that and I'll go out in a little bit of, of a limb here to say that in our offices, um, to be able to offer a career path for a person, a person with disabilities in our offices is generally a little 
a little more easier for us to be able to do just based on a controlled environment. It's, it's, it's consistent and sustained. But that being said, there is there's more that we can be doing. So one of the things that we've been working with is talking to the Rick Hansen Foundation and having an assessment done in our main office to see how accessible is it. And one of the things that I remember quite clearly is one of our executives broke her broke her ankle one time and uh, she wasn't able to maneuver around the office very well. She, all of the automated door systems were you know, steps away from where the door actually opened. The doors were very heavy. So I think there's massive improvements from an infrastructure building perspective that we can be doing. Thankfully, I think COVID has helped with that, with a lot of the no touch uh, areas. So I think that that has been helpful. But from an office perspective, we do need to make more enhancements and we do need to be intentional about it. And it's something that we have looked for some, some help on to figure out um, the things that we don't know, the things that we may not see in our, in our own blind spot. So we've been doing that. From a construction site perspective, that is certainly a, a larger challenge and just in, in the sense of what is um, some of the, the transitional natures of our job sites, the accessibility. I mean, quite honestly, it's not very good. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about doing, and we actually have a meeting about it next week, is speaking with um, um, a person who is in a wheelchair and, and he's one of our, he's fantastic. He said a lot of, it's David Dam, I'll just say it's David Dam. He's the director of, of uh, accessibility at, at Microsoft. And we are developing a plan to work with him and under his leadership and guidance to be able to say, let's take you on a, let's, let's make sure that you're safe and you're comfortable and let's take you on a site tour. Let's, let's us help um, understand what it, what things that we don't see and like, can you help us do that? And that's something that, is very, uh, very scary and something that we have to work out a ton of logistics on because we've never done that before. We've always industry-wide said, if you're in a wheelchair, there's no way you're going on a job site. And now we're challenging that to say, well, maybe you can. And so we're trying to figure out how to do that. But the honest answer is we need a lot of help and we don't know what we don't know. And Analyst Dawn is actively looking at finding out some of the things that we don't know and how we can improve them. That's right. Thank you for that. All right, so we have four minutes now. Somebody's gonna keep track of all this good stuff. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask each of you to spend maybe a minute and uh, kind of a final thought, but your best advice. What advice can you offer to our attendees that are hoping to affect change within their own organization, organizations, keeping in mind that you guys are probably way ahead of uh, most organizations in terms of diversity. So think if there's someone here who would really like to affect change within their own organization. Maybe they're not the leadership. Maybe they're sort of middle ranks, if you will. What what can they do? What effectively can they go and, and help to move things forward? Um, where should they start? Or I mean, it doesn't have to be the very beginning, but certainly the things that could maybe make the biggest impact would be, be great. Um, I'm gonna pick and choose. Maybe Kathy, let's start with you. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think um, I think everyone from whether they're a senior leadership position or like a middle level professional like myself, I think there's something that everybody can do to increase diversity and inclusion in their own company. Um, I think I personally um, not only benefited from the mentorship I received from uh, you know more senior people, but I also enjoy uh, a lot interacting with like younger um, uh, students and you know younger professionals. And uh, you know um, I think what really helped me um, in my interactions with them is you know to provide tangible examples of how um, in our work we can not only you know enrich people's lives but also we can build a you know fulfilling career ourselves um i one example i like to share is you know uh, at the beginning of uh, my career i worked on this project called okanagan wind so we built a 30 megawatt wind farm in british columbia and um, that powers about 9,000 homes and um, we worked very closely with the local first nations um, we entered into an impact benefits agreement with them we provided annual uh, benefits payments to them access to employment opportunities and you know scholarships for the local kids it was overall a great experience um, for us and you know it's it's it's, it's a projects like that i think will um, really attract young people to, 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 to our industry here. And Maddie, how about you? Final thoughts, some advice? Oh, mute. Oh, nope, you're good now. <laughs> Jennifer uh, picked up on this, which is I think look introspectively uh, within your own organization to see where uh, you might have gaps um, and then be part of the change. 
and uh, there are net, I think what we've learned from today is there are networks, there's information out there, there are people who are doing this work that you can plug into. Um, you don't have to be alone. And um, if you are thinking that something is wrong or that there's a gap uh, in your company, someone else internally is probably thinking that, uh, and someone else externally has probably grappled with that exact same issue within their own company. Uh, and, and I think that the work that Kathy has done, that Rosemary is doing, that Jennifer is doing, there are resources out there, plug into those and use those to make the change that you want to see in your own in your own organization. Thank you, Matt. And Jennifer. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's a ton of resources already out there, either within your own networks or even through Google. I mean, there's so many ideas that are out there. So I'll take a different spin on this and say that if you're working within this space, if you're trying to initiate change and create the change for your organization, my advice to you would be to define your boundaries understand that as an individual what is it that you're where are you willing to go and where are you willing not to go and by when and so set yourself some time frames because this work is challenging and so the other piece to that is take care of yourself and your own mental health this is uh, you know it's 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 lonely being a change maker it's lonely being a leader and it comes with a lot of emotional and sometimes physical burdens so make sure that you're taking care, care of yourself first as well as um, setting yourself up for success but understanding what you're willing to do and what you're not willing to do thank you all right rosemary bring us home okay so i think mentorship absolutely because the experience is what people talk about the most uh from our um you know uh, participants what they experience once once they get into the job site and so mentorship is really really key and every individual within the workplace who have that experience um can um you know help to make it a little bit easier for the new person that comes in secondly i shared in the chat uh the uh, build force assessment take the assessment uh, to see if your organization is a respectful uh, workplace and look at ways for how you can intentionally, continuously improve that. Amazing. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you to all of our panelists today. And a super big thank you as well to our attendees. Your participation through the chat feature and poll questions really drive a level of intimacy for these events that we wouldn't have otherwise. So again, thank you. A recording of today's webinar will be available about 15 minutes following its conclusion. So if you have colleagues that you think might be interested in this discussion, it'll be available for replay. Join us again on September 23rd for the Infraintelligence Uncovering Water Infrastructure Solutions webinar. In this important discussion, linear water infrastructure experts will review the findings of Renew Canada's recent survey and provide perspective on underground infrastructure renewal options. If you follow actual media up there at the top of your screen, you'll automatically get a notification for your upcoming webinar. So thank you again, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.